Hello everyone. We are doing something different today. And I'm looking for something. Mm, not what I want. I need something else. So I'm letting you enjoy the reef for a moment. The uh, live stream should be in 4K mode, which is something we've never done before. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Um, I'm looking for a capital D. <laughs> and I can't find one. Just ridiculous. There's a little tiny one. I need one that you guys can see. God, I'm going through the whole magazine. Oh, there's one. All right. Got something. Anyway, I'm letting you enjoy the reef while I do this. And then we'll get into our topic and a demonstration and everything. So if you are listening to this one, you might actually want to watch it. Okay, I'm almost ready. So this silly thing I'm doing, it's just for giggles. But I wanted to do it. So how does it look? Does it look good? And I'm assuming it sounds good. <laughs> I see a lot of you saying hello. I'm not ignoring you, I promise. Okay, let's do this. And FYI, I do have a dog here. Sometimes she goes nuts and starts barking. So if you're trying to protect your eardrums, I'm giving you fair notice that there is a chance you will be upset with me. That should work. Hee hee hee. All right. 4K said, they said 4K would be more satisfying. All right, so I've got my D ready for later. <laughs> Hello everyone. So today we are shooting the live stream with a D500 Nikon camera with an 18 to 200 millimeter lens. And we are allowed to see me in focus, I hope, and the reef is in focus. It's actually kind of challenging. I can't pre-focus it, and I'm still trying to learn the settings on the camera. But I am hoping to, at some point, I found an option in the book that talked about how it would constantly focus on your face. Kind of a neat feature, might come in handy. Because I almost need like a, I know it sounds ridiculous, a mannequin standing here to focus everything and then throw it out of the way and put myself in place because I don't have a second warm body to be my person. But I'm hoping this looks pretty good. And we do have a demo today about how to pack corals. And I thought this actually was a request from one of you. So, you know, if you guys have a request for a certain topic, please feel free to contact me and tell me what you're thinking. And if it's something I can cover, I'll do it. I've actually never talked about packing corals before. I don't sell corals for a living. I did recently ship out 17 livestock orders. So that was um, a lot of work. And I had a friend come up to help me on the first day with the first 10. And we got a system down, and then I said, okay, I can handle it from here. So the, uh, <clears throat> the process, I thought I'd show you. I did a really quick uh, time lapse on Instagram and on Facebook that you may have seen. But here you can kind of see it in real time. Uh, there's, a, there's a few devices that I use, so I'll switch cameras here. So right down here, I've got something called an impulse sealer, which is this device that plugs in. It's electric, and it has a heat strip in there. This is the instruction book that came with it. It's very simple. It says plug it in and use it. On the front of the device, there is a temperature knob for how much heat you want coming off the strip. And then when you press down, it actually starts warming up. It's pretty quick and simple. And hopefully it'll do what I'm supposed to do. I mean, I've got it plugged in. I didn't test it before the stream. I always test everything. And then inside of it, as you can't see it exactly, but I have a spare heat strip here that it came with. It came with a second one. And this came from Amazon for like 40 bucks. It doesn't cost a lot. So if you're actually sharing frags with other people, it's nice to have a way to quickly close a bag in one second flat instead of having to, um, I don't know, uh, rubber band things to death where it takes a while. This is really quick and painless and it's, it's a lot of fun. It uses simple bags. Um, I, I don't know what these are. Uh, but they're the kind of bags everyone uses for fish stores. They come in different sizes. 
And I used, this was just probably like two inches wide, maybe two or three inches wide, and about 12 inches long or so. And this works out really well for frags. I actually was able to ship the nano NEMS on them because they are so small. This must be, I don't know, I don't have a tape measure handy, guys. I'm sorry. And then this bag is obviously a larger size, which could hold something more and hold more water. And then <clears throat> the next step would be to put it inside some styrofoam. So what I did this week was actually made my own styrofoam boxes. Let's see if I can tilt this up just slightly. <clears throat> so I made four sides with a top and a bottom. And then I will tape the entire thing shut so that everything is inside and temperature controlled. And this is one inch thick foam, which is pretty great compared to most of the coolers you see out there that come with a little bit of livestock. So um, let's start off first with the actual packing of something. So I will grab a something whatever. And one of the things I like to do with these bags, because it's a little tricky to like dip this into the water and scoop water up. What I like to do is put this in front of the nozzle, the return pump is pushing water into the tank and let it fill up the bag about halfway. And then when it's half full, I can go ahead and drop the frag inside. So let me go grab something, just whatever I can find. <clears throat> and a little bit of water. Do I have anything handy? How about an empty snail shell? Would anything work? How about a Mahano? Anyone want a Mahano? I've got those. All right, I found something nobody wants. Perfect. <laughs> so here's my bag of water. Here's my snail shell with some Mahanos on it. You can see it a little bit better there. And then the next step, I like to dry it off on the outside first before I put it on the heat, uh, heat melting machine. So I just wipe the bag. Then I will just lay this down <clears throat> next to the machine. And I will press down, let go, lift it up, move it over half an inch, press down, lift up. And now I've got it double sealed. Hopefully this doesn't spill water out everywhere. See, it worked. So that is super nice. And then what you can do next is double bag it, put it inside a second bag, or if you want, which is easier, and what I did, I took all my bags and I put them inside the larger bag, fold the top over so that it was out of my way, twisted it, and stuck a rubber band on the top just as an extra so I'm not relying only on the heat sealing for this because I was shipping it. And then this is ready to go into the box. Now, one of the things that I feel is really important for you to realize is if you're doing a lot of these for some reason, the first one is the one that's going to get the coldest because it took the longest. So it's really critical that you try to time everything well. If you can prepare all your boxes and all your little coolers in advance, that will save you time. So that way you're just bagging, putting in the box and closing it up. Now, the next step for me, I'm going to move this thing out of my way and bring this closer. And this will be a little bit noisy. Maybe I should mute my microphone for a second for this part. But what I like to do at this point is tape my box together. So I'll hit mute. I'm back. Yes. Okay. So here we have the lower half of the box ready to go. Um, let me do this again. Oh no. Why did we lose our cam link? Why did we lose the good camera? What the heck? All right. Well, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so we've got this box here. And at this point, I would put my corals inside. And then I don't want it to shake around in the box and be beat to death. 
So I would next put in a bunch of packing peanuts to actually do more than just keep it in place. It also is another form of insulation to maintain the temperature of the livestock. And then I will take this on top. Well, I would drop in a coaster next and then I would tape it on top. Uh, let me see if I can get that other camera to work first before we go any further. That was weird. It just basically turned itself off for no good reason. All right, so we'll see what happens here. All right, so now uh, the next step that I would want to emphasize, especially this time of year when it's 90 to 100 degrees outside, is to consider your temperature where you are and the temperature of the destination it's getting to. And so you may need to actually put a cold pack inside here, a very small frozen block that goes inside with the corals to keep the temperature okay. If you don't do that, you'll end up with, you know, basically a 100 degree box getting there. Even though it's been insulated and everything started at 78 degrees, 80 degrees, but the longer it sits inside the cooler, the longer it sits in the back of a truck, the longer it sits in a warehouse or a distribution center, all that heat will gradually get in, which is one of the reasons why when I'm doing these boxes, I tape every seam shut so no air can leak in or out. It also helps keep any moisture inside if there were to be a small leak. But I like to completely seal the box so that no airflow moves. Now, if it's winter and you're trying to ship this stuff, then you're going to use something called a heat pack. And you've probably heard of hot hands, which is little packets that you would like shake up and then put inside your pockets. And then when you're walking down the street, your hands are in inside your pockets of your jacket and your hands are nice and toasty warm because of hot hands, you can use the hot hands inside your little cooler as well. What I like to do in that situation is grab something like newspaper or brown packing paper or something and I wrap, I, first I heat up the hot hand. So it takes about 10 minutes or so to completely warm up. You tear open the package, you take it, you shake this kind of uh, uh, media that's inside that's some kind of a chemical and it warms up and it needs air to do that. So if you just take it, tear it open, and put it in instantly, it didn't warm up and it's a sealed container, not enough air to do anything. So you gotta give it about 10 minutes to warm up. Once it's warm, you can wrap it. And the reason we wrap it in something and then you tape it on the underside of the lid of your box is so it doesn't just sit directly in the bag and warm the bag up really badly. We wanna just create enough heat in the box so that the temperature doesn't drop while it's sitting at FedEx or wherever you're going um, for the duration and it'll last six, eight hours or so until it's completely dissipated. So it's a good starting point for winter shipments. For summer, like I said, you want the little small ice packs. If you buy any livestock online, a lot of times it'll come with an ice pack. Don't throw them away, throw them in the freezer and save them for the day you need them yourself. And then you've got something you can put in. And again, wrap it a little bit, tape it to the inside of the lid and set it down inside. I, I've seen people do some of the craziest things. Like they will take one of these things, they've taped the box shut, and then for some reason, I don't know why, they put the ice pack on the top of the outside of the box, put a piece of tape on there, put it in the big box and ship it. That does absolutely no good. It has to be inside the box, underneath the lid, preferably. And that way you're adding the coolness during the summer or you're adding the heat during the winter. Super important thing to do. My best recommendation is don't ship anything in the summer, don't ship anything in the winter. Always aim for spring and for fall when the temperatures are mild, when the temperature outside is like 70 degrees or so. That is a much better scenario because that way you've got the ability to uh, provide the best chance for success in getting what you're shipping to the other person. And another thing is that I've seen people do, and it just boggles my mind, they will take their bagged item. Oh, just pretend I took the one out of here. And they'll just put it in any old box, just a plastic bag in a box, and they'll tape it shut and they'll ship it. And it's not even kept to, from moving in the box. It's just bouncing around in there. It's a terrible, terrible plan. So what we wanna do is, I'm gonna make some noise here. I told you I'd mute myself, so let me do it one more time.
field. I can go ahead and I can drop it directly into this box. It is the exact same size, so it won't move or shift. And then when I close it, it just is ready to go. And now you get some noise. Okay. I didn't want to blast you guys with that for every single piece of tape I pulled, but for these three, you get to hear it. Now this guy is ready to go. If you were to uh, get this done at like four in the afternoon, that would be ideal. Four to five o'clock is the best time of, uh, to pack a coral and then get it to FedEx right before six, ship it overnight. No priority mail, no two or three days stuff. Like I said, I shipped 17 of these and three of the 17 did not get their own time. Now one of them was the customer gave me the wrong address and that is completely his fault. And I'm, he felt bad. And the point is, if you're ordering something online, give us the right address. I mean, come on, you have one job. I have so many jobs, you have one. I need the correct address. So make sure you have the right address, double check with a customer that you're trying to send, or your friend that you're trying to send to make sure everything's correct. And then I recommend overnight shipping. There's two things you can do with overnight. You can either ship it directly to their door overnight, which uh, is more convenient for them, or you can ship it to the nearest FedEx Kinko's location near them where they can pick it up at nine o'clock in the morning. So you drop it off right before six. The guy throws it on his truck at six o'clock or 6.15 or whatever. And by 9 a.m. it's at a Kinko's near them where they can drive up and get it at 9.01 and they can go straight home with their new livestock. The other thing I wanna highly recommend is that you never ever ever ship for a Friday arrival or a Saturday, forget the weekends because weekends are when everything goes wrong. It is so important that you ship um, where it can get there the next day. And if something goes wrong, there's a chance you'll get an extra day out of the deal. But if you ship for a Friday arrival because you think, oh, well, that works better for me, and it doesn't show up, it probably won't come again until Monday. And by then everything's completely lost. And especially in the summer, especially the, mid the middle of winter. So we wanna do everything we can to do uh, a shipment earlier in the week. I've never received a, a night, I said it wrong. I've never received a livestock order near a weekend. I intentionally place orders to arrive on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. And I highly recommend that to you. Now these boxes here with my account, I was able to ship these 10 by 10 by seven boxes that weighed about four pounds and it cost about 50 bucks a box to ship it overnight. So that gives you an idea of what it costs for shipping and you may have to pay more. It may be even higher. So don't be surprised if you get an 80 or $90 bill. That is not some ripoff. That is exactly what they charge. I've asked other coral vendors, how do you get such good rates? And they said, we don't. <laughs> so, but I mean, that's what they do. They basically wrap it up in the price of the, the livestock and you know, they charge a little bit. So um, when you get that $35 overnight shipping and then they do a $10 box fee, that's almost at that $50 price I was describing to you. And uh, so that does that, that is for shipping. Now, what if you are traveling? What if you are moving across the state or across another part of the nation and you wanna take your livestock with you? What if you're on vacation and you go into a store and you see something you want and you're gonna be going home that day? How can you get it home safely in your luggage, in your vehicle, uh, in your carry-on, you know, what are the different techniques? So I thought we could talk about that as well today. Um, it is so warm today. I mean, like it's 96 outside and I say in here, it's probably, I don't know, 72. And I'm just like, oh. <laughs> so, um, if you want to bring home livestock from somewhere far away where it's going to take you five or six hours to get home, you do not want to just throw the bag on the back seat and hope for the best. You don't want to put in your cup holder near the air conditioner vent blowing on it. You don't want the sun to bake on it. Uh, think about this. Whenever you go to get livestock at the fish store, how did they get it? Just think about that for a minute. And if you don't know how they get it, ask them how they got their livestock. Because I guarantee you it came in a styrofoam lined cardboard box that was freighted overnight so it would get there intact in one piece. And then they unpack, and even as they unpack, some things are dead. So there's no 100% guarantee, and you have to go into that knowing you may not succeed at this. It may not work out. It may. Uh, like I said, out of the 17 I shipped, uh, 14 were perfect. And 
one was sent to the wrong place, which took a whole extra day. And then two went somewhere into the FedEx world and got stuck for a day. And then finally was delivered and they died. It just didn't work. It's too long. You want to keep your livestock in water from in those bags of water, maybe 12 hours. Uh, I wouldn't go much longer. I really wouldn't. I, I, you know, it is what it is. You know, if it goes a little bit longer, that's why I use one inch thick insulation to try and help. But there's just so much that can go wrong in that time. And it's only a little bit of water. Now, if you used a bigger bag and you had more water, the box would be heavier, but you'd be able to do more. All right, so it turned off again. I'm gonna have to find out why it does that. I'm so glad, you know, it's so funny. Last night I tested this and I let it run nonstop the whole time. I wonder if it's a, like some kind of a, you haven't touched a shutter in 10 seconds, in 10 minutes. <laughs> that might be it. But what a difference in cameras, right? I mean, of course, granted, this camera is all set up hideously. Let me see if I can clean that up just a little bit. Nah, it's just a little bit better, but not much. And then we'll switch back to this. If you <clears throat> wanted to, if you wanted to bring home livestock, like on an airplane, like you went to visit family or you went to visit friends or whatever, and you decided I'm gonna stop at Worldwide Corals in Florida, I'm gonna get myself some beautiful corals. There are certain tricks that do work. The best thing would be a little cooler and then put that cooler in the middle of your suitcase, wrap your laundry all around it. So in 360 degrees, and that way you could go ahead and you could enjoy not worrying about it because it's in your luggage and you can get, you know, and then when you get home and you get your suitcase off the conveyor belt, you open it instantly and double check how everything is before you even go to your car. That's what I always do when it comes to livestock. And you can use some kind of a collapsible cooler. The thicker, the better. I'm talking about one of those ones that would hold a bunch of beer cans. Um, and they're soft. This is a really bad example of one. This is a super soft, very, very thin bag. This would not be ideal. I mean, would it help better than zero? Yes, but I'd much rather have one that's thicker. I used to have a really cool one. I got it at Macna many years ago. And then one day the zipper just rusted and I couldn't use it ever again. And that thing was awesome. It was really big. It held a couple of six packs at least. And uh, it had pockets in there and it had a big strap to carry it. And it was very, very thick and it did a great job. And I could put in a lot, I could bring home 15, 20 frags inside my suitcase. Now, if you can't do that, do you have room to squeeze one of these inside your suitcase? Is there any chance that one of these styrofoam things would fit in there? But you see how thin the walls are and it's, it's crushable, it could break. And if it does crush or, um, you know, because your suitcase may not be rock hard, then you may have some leakage inside your aquarium. So it's nice to have something, anything. Now, if you get, what I've done in situations like this is I put the corals inside here, I taped it shut to seal it. I put it inside a trash bag, tied the bag shut, and then put that inside my suitcase. So, I mean, that's another way. If you're wanting to bring your corals home as carry-on, then your next choice might be, especially if it's SPS corals, you can take a bag like we had before, and you can have your SPS frag in there, with water all the way up to the airport. And then when you get to the airport, open the bag, pour out all the water, and just leave a wet paper towel in there. Just, you know, jam a paper towel in there first, I guess. And then, because this bag's so small. And then when you've got a wet paper towel wrapped around it, then you can just take this thing and you can tie it or put a knot in it or rubber band it or however you want to close it. And you can put it in your carry-on because there's no liquid in there. All it is is a damp or, no, it's a wet paper towel with SPS corals. This doesn't work with all of them, but it works with many of them. Bird's nest won't do well, but Acropora should. And I've done that before. And I would either keep it inside my pocket of my jacket, or I had it inside my camera bag that I carry on the plane with me. And I came home with lots of frags that way. Uh, you could probably do the wet paper towel for other things like zooanthids and mushrooms and so forth. But um, that's when you really have no other choice and you're just super worried about TSA. Now, if you were trying to come home with a fish, that's a whole other argument with TSA, and they may cooperate, they may not. The, uh, the thing is, is that if they can hold up the bag and they can see the fish swimming around, that should indicate to them that it's water and that it's safe. But I recently saw someone post how TSA actually took a water sample out to measure it while the fish was still swimming around, which is insane to me. But the other choice is TSA could say, no, you can't take it on the plane, it's too much water, and that would suck. 
I remember uh, years ago, I bought two eels at Macna, and I had my camera bag that hangs on my hip, and I had uh, my big backpack. And so in my camera bag, I put in two eels. <laughs> it was like 10 pounds of water. And I got to the airport, and I told the lady at the counter, I said, look, I have two eels with me. And she just looked at me, and I'm like, I want to know if you guys are going to give me grief, or if I can just take this on the plane without any words. And she said, I don't know. And I knew that airline, it, they would charge you $100 at the door for some extra bag. You're allowed one, carry on, not two. And I had my backpack, plus I had that bag. So I just said, we'll just have to do what we have to do. And she said, well, I can't guarantee anything. I said, you know what? How much does it cost to put this in my suitcase and make the bag too heavy? And she said, $25. And I took the entire thing off me and I just put it inside the suitcase and I sealed it and I paid 25 extra. And then when I got home, I immediately you know, got the, the uh, suitcase off the conveyor belt, opened it up, saw some leakage. The bags were still full of water, which was good. And uh, you know, I, I held it right side up and you know, put it in my car. And I came home and I had those eels for several years. So that was really, really cool. But I just didn't want to take a chance with TSA and I definitely didn't want to take a chance with the airline giving me any kind of problems. So I went that route. But you will have to choose what works best for you. Some people have gone to the trouble using big coolers and they will then put a hole in the top and they will put an air stone in there with a battery powered bubbler because they're driving across the state and they try to keep the livestock alive in their car or they use power inverters to run air pumps and run small heaters, things like that. That is another way to try and do it. The uh, trick is keeping everything oxygenated for as long as possible checking on them frequently throughout the trip and making sure they're not getting too hot, uh, that you're not losing water for some reason, nothing's leaking or breaking, and just general health of the animals. Some people like to go move to the new location, set up the new tank, get it ready before they ever move the livestock and it stays in the old location like their old home and they will pay an extra house payment or an extra month's rent or whatever just so they can make the transition more smooth so when it's time to actually move livestock day they're not moving furniture and everything else under the sun they're literally going there to get their critters and move them and others have left their animals with friends and that said please ship it to me overnight or with a fish store and said can you ship it to me there's a lot of things that can go wrong <laughs> and there's no guarantees it'll go right and sometimes it's just easier just part ways with everything you own set up your new tank start fresh but i wanted to talk about some of these ways of doing things with you hoping that it would help you in figuring out what potential options you have when it comes to getting livestock home uh, when traveling and uh, when moving and when selling to friends <laughs> um i would like to say to the general public that is buying frags from other people they don't know I'm going to highly urge you to never, ever, ever do the friends and family method through PayPal because you will get nothing but grief if something goes wrong. They, there's no guarantees of any kind anyway with livestock, but you won't be able to get a refund if things go bad with a seller because they did a bad job because you did friends and family. You didn't pay the 3% tax. So just pay the penalty. If, if they're really upset about the, the fees, if they really can't take it, Either don't buy from them or pay 3% more and say, look, I covered the fees to protect me. And hopefully you won't get ripped off. So I can recommend that. But I've read so many times where people said, I ordered the stuff from this guy. Everyone said he's so good. This went so badly. I got a box of death. No one will give me my money back. You know, the guy won't respond to me. The guy has blocked me. I mean, I've heard it all. <clears throat> so I highly recommend that you don't do that. Um, I'm wondering how many times this camera is going to turn off during this stream. <laughs> I'm glad we have a backup camera. I mean, that helps just a, a tad, but it's not great. So, um, I got some other things to tell you about today. Uh, a Caitlin story, because I do one each week. So, we bought this big jar of jelly beans, and uh, the Jelly Bellies are one of my favorite brands. And in here are a thousand different colors. And everything that was dark in here, if she thought it was black, she gave it to me because she hates black licorice. And I love it. And she would hand me dozens of these dark beans and I'd be watching TV with her and she's snacking on the colorful ones and I'm getting these dark ones from her. And she'd say to me after every single one I put in my mouth, was it licorice? I'm like, nope. <laughs> was it licorice? I'm like, nope. And I mean, it was like out of 10, one was licorice. And she's like, dang it. 
because she did like all the other flavors. She just did not want licorice, but she kept assuming, oh, well, that definitely has to be one. And it wasn't. And it was really funny to me how that kept happening. So that was one of today's funny stories. I also shared something on Instagram this week um, that I don't know if you saw it. So I thought I'd put it on the show today. So this is a little uh, square vase that I got uh, that had flowers in it. And it's the perfect size to soak a Vortec head. So what I do is I put in vinegar and water and let it sit for 24 hours and then I scrub it. And what I use is this thing right here, which this is a really hard one compared to the ones you normally get. The ones you get usually are kind of a soft bristle. We got these off of Amazon. It was a, it was a kit with a, with a few sponges and then a soft bristle brush and then this really rigid one. And Caitlin just threw this under the sink and ignored it. And I'm reading the box because I, ah, Dang camera. <laughs> At least I notice. It's not like the audio where I never know I'm not even, I'm talking to silence. Uh, so anyway, I'm reading the box. And in the box, it says that the one is meant for cleaning dishes. And then this one was for scrubbing uh, cast iron skillets. And I was like, ooh, that's pretty nice. And so I've been using it like on cookie sheets and stuff to really get them clean. It works great. Turns out this is the best brush ever to clean a Vortec wet side. So if you have a power head that you've soaked in vinegar and water and then you wanna clean it, these kind of brushes would be awesome to just scrub. I mean, this one I scrubbed. This is a clean one from using this. And it was all covered in coralline and green hair algae and whatever algae was on it. And I just scrubbed the heck out of it. I took it completely apart, scrubbed everything, scrubbed the blade, scrubbed the inside, took a small toothbrush for the area between the plastic and the magnet and just completely cleaned it. And you can see it's in great clean shape. I mean, it, it's really great. <laughs> I can't say great enough. Anyway, super awesome little tool, not meant for the aquarium trade, works perfectly for it. So if you're interested in something like that, I can probably find a, the link from when we bought it and send that to you so you can see it. And uh, before people lose their minds saying, you used vinegar, I've been using vinegar for 20 years and I've not lost equipment to it. And somehow there's this massive campaign that vinegar destroys all plastics and all the pumps fail. I have put every kind of pump I've ever owned through vinegar baths, whether it's internal uh, pumps, external pumps, power heads, uh, Vortex, Tunzi, uh, you name it. If you are really concerned that you're going to destroy the plastic, what you can do is you can soak it for a fixed amount of hours. And then if you don't have time to clean it right then, you can then drain off the water and vinegar and put new water in there and just let it sit until you have time to scrub it. But now at least it's all softened up and it's ready to get clean. But if you want to use citric acid, you can. I am just saying I have gallons and gallons of white vinegar and it works perfectly fine and I have no problems with it. And I'm not going to jump on the campaign that you can't use vinegar anymore and tell everyone not to because we've been doing it forever. And if it was destroying everything we owned, I mean, this thing right here, is years old, okay? It's not like I just put it in vinegar for the first time. So don't fear vinegar. You can use it 100%, you can use it at 50-50 with water, you can use 10% if you want, whatever makes you happy. But I wouldn't worry about using white vinegar, it's completely safe to use. And um, if someone had something go wrong, I would love to see some really good pictures depicting what happened. I'd like to know how long it was in vinegar, how long was it ignored, you know, what all happened. I'd like to know a lot of details to, before I'm gonna start believing this one. It just sounds so crazy to me. And I understand we want our things to last forever. And I do too. I've got pumps in this tank that are 10 years old that I'm finally now replacing just because they're 10 years old, not because they're broken. Um, and then I wanted to show you guys a new product that I just got. This is a nitrate absorption resin that is regeneratable but it makes no sense that they call it nitrate R. It just doesn't. So we're gonna fix that. D nitrate. <laughs> Told you guys I was looking for a D. If it removes nitrate, it should be D nitrate. Why wouldn't they call it D nitrate? So anyway, I've got two jars of this. I'm gonna try it out on my reef inside a reactor. I've got a couple other things I'm gonna do because as I've told you guys many times, I have nitrate problems in this tank and I've been trying to resolve them with different products and I wanted to try this one. So um, something interesting that came up in a conversation, I was talking with MetroCat who works with Jack Kent. Jack Kent has been around forever. He made the Kent products that we use in our aquariums, the bottled stuff. 
He runs uh, Continuum now, as far as I know, and works with Brightwell as well. And he said to me, or through Metricat, he said, how often are you removing the macroalgae in your refugium? And I was like, I don't know, once a month or so I take some out. And he is uh, theorizing that perhaps what's happening is my macroalgae on the top is bright green and doing well. And what's underneath is dying and releasing the nitrate into the water. And that's why I continually have nitrate because I'm not actually removing the algae as frequently as I should. So the plan is to remove more of the macroalgae and to dose some carbon and to use this denitrate or these nitrate R stuff and see what that does for the tank to bring the numbers down, which would be really nice because uh, at this point, it's just not smart for me to add any kind of fish or any kind of invertebrate while I have these numbers up. Um, they need to come down. All right. Um, I only talked about shipping corals because that's typical what you buy. We don't normally buy fish from other people online. If someone's selling fish online, they should know exactly how to ship them safely. And so that doesn't really touch most of you, so it makes no sense to go into that. But if you're taking fish home from a faraway city, for example, I live in Fort Worth. San Antonio is about four and a half, five hours away. If I was down in a fish store in San Antonio and wanted to come home with a fish, I wouldn't just take a, a bagged fish home because there's a good chance it won't survive that long a drive with just regular air. But if the fish store offers oxygen, O2, that they can pump into the bag, not just compressed air, but actual medical grade oxygen, that would make me feel a lot more secure in getting my fish home safely. Otherwise, I just wouldn't buy it and I would just wait till I'm home and hopefully find it in a local store. But, um, and that's why so often when you receive big bags with fish in them, half the bag is water and half of it's compressed air. That is to provide plenty of oxygen and a, a decent body of water for the fish. And those fish weren't fed for 24 hours before they shipped. So there's a lot of thought that goes into moving fish across the nation. And they definitely were shipped and are shipped in styrofoam coolers inside cargo boxes overnight, instant shipping, no priority mail, no, <laughs> no ground shipping, nothing like that. It needs to get there, it needs to get there now. So that is, I think, everything I want to talk about today. I had a feeling we might have problems with the camera, so I didn't come up with something super long. I would like to answer some of your questions. <clears throat> I'm gonna probably have to keep running over there and turning the camera back on because that's what it keeps doing. And, and I'll have to find out why it's doing that because it's probably some setting. This camera has a thousand settings I don't know anything about. But I like that I'm in focus and the reef is in focus. You can see all the flaws now. You can <laughs> and that's okay because uh, in a couple of weeks, Dwayne's going to be here. We're going to start tearing the reef down to get a whole bunch of stuff out and declutter and put cute things in there to start with a new, fresh amount of growth. And um, the things that, for example, this acro right here, the bottom piece, that's completely dead. That was the Drew's acro. On top of it is an actual branch that survived that I had on the sand for all this time. And I put it up there two days ago. Underneath it was a different acro called a blueberry acro. And when I reached into the tank, I barely brushed it and the whole darn thing just went snap and fell. And so I put that in the back on top of the blue tort that died. <laughs> so I'm using these dead corals as, as placeholders right now for other corals just temporarily until I can get things reset on the tank. And you may have noticed there's a white spot right there. That is a mysterious amount of RTN happening on the lime in the sky. Don't know why it's doing it. Can't really come up with a cause other than I guess it doesn't like nitrate, but I don't know. I mean, I don't know why it's happening. There's nothing to correlate. There's nothing to explain it. So I just, like, all right, and I just left it alone. I don't touch it. I let what happens happens. I trim out what I can later on and um, move on with my life. So now you guys can see the tank a lot better. I actually, I'm very happy with it. And by the way, the lighting is set with a very specific profile on the skies to make this work on the camera. But the camera does give me a lot of flexibility to change uh, Kelvins and all, and, and uh, avoid blown out areas like we've had with a webcam and uh, to have things more in focus. It's gonna, hopefully I'll get better and better in the weeks to come and we'll find a way to make the camera not turn off. <laughs> so let me go and find some of these uh, questions of yours and try to answer some of them. Uh, a lot of my uh, friends this weekend are at, Reef at uh, Aquashella in Orlando right now. And I 
did not go. Kind of am sad I didn't go, but I was not ready to go, so I did not. Ah, Thomas says the green nano BTA and the fungia coral are doing amazingly well. Those are two items I shipped to him this last week. I'm actually happy that most of the orders got there safely, and the ones that didn't work out, they're going to go out again next week. So it's not like a total, total loss. It's just frustrating. But I will just repack them again. But now I might have to do the little ice pack because next week it's gonna be, we're going to be up in the upper 90s. Now, the beauty of dropping off my shipments at 6 o'clock in the afternoon, it's not quite as hot outside, and it goes inside a FedEx building that's cool. But then the truck driver takes it, and they don't refrigerate the back of their trucks. You know, it's just a hot truck. And then they go to a distribution center that has all the garage doors wide open, and it is the heat of the day, and guys driving around with forklifts nonstop. I've seen it in person. So there is a good chance that it'll be really hot, and will the box make it? That's going to be a trick. All right, let me fix the camera. Thank you for putting up with my... Uh, new gear let's see ah jason you're absolutely right the impulse impulse sealer would be great for your cookies and as long as nothing touches and smashes the frosting right uh, alex says how long should corals be acclimated when your alkalinity is drastically different from the lfs uh, check salinity as well as alkalinity, but we want to get everything as close as possible. When we say drastically, I need to know the number, but uh, in general, with corals, we aren't nearly as picky as we are with fish. And you can take a coral, temperature acclimated for about 25 minutes, and then just pull it out of the bag and dip it first and then put it into your aquarium. And that usually works out pretty well. Now, I did warn the people that ordered from me this week that received stuff. I said, remember, guys, I have high nitrate. And a lot of you guys out there with your tanks with low nitrate, you may get a reverse reaction from some of the livestock. It's a good possibility because it's so drastic, like Alex is just saying. So it's important to know how um, big a difference it is. If the alkalinity is 8 in your tank and the alkalinity is 11 in the bag of water, there's not a lot you can do besides dilute the water down first before you put the coral in your tank. That would be one way to kind of uh, bring it down. But um, I've usually not worried about alkalinity whatsoever. I, I don't even check that in a bag of water that I get. I check temperature and I check salinity. Those are the two things I care about the most. Ah, Marcus says he hates packing peanuts. I love them. I buy ginormous bags of them and I pay a lot of money for them. There are different kinds on the market. I found out, for example, you know when you order them from BRS, they have a kind, maybe Marine Depot, they have a kind that's biodegradable and uh, basically melts with water, apparently. Well, it turns out they have less, uh, they're less strong for impact. They're, they're not as durable. So the ones I buy are more, more tough because I ship a lot of things that are dry goods and I want them to get to you safely. And I, you know, I realize once you got them, what are you gonna do with them? But in, I remember I used to put posts up in our club's forum asking anyone, if you have packing peanuts, if you receive shipments, save them in bags for me and at the club meeting, give me all your trash. And then I would use those peanuts up as quickly as possible because I shipped out so many orders. But uh, no, I just, I have no, I actually love them a lot. They, they're very practical and I use them constantly. I am very cautious with my packing if something gets to the customer broken i'm usually really shocked i'm very surprised i have to think of how hard did that box get hit to to break through everything and shatter something made of acrylic inside uh mike says the hot hands need oxygen and the box needs to have a hole poked in it no i disagree i totally disagree activate the hot hands to get it started and then after the 10 minutes or so put it inside and seal the box there was one of our, Mike, you work with Eric in, in the moderator forum, and Eric had a box shipped to him with a hole poked in it, and everything got icy cold inside, and he lost all his livestock. So you can go argue with him about that. But no, we do not poke holes in coolers. We want the coolers to contain all the temperature, as well as if there's a bag breakage, we don't want the water leaking out the hole. So I disagree. Let's see. Um, 
Some people, okay, Adam's saying uh, something about the Saltwater Scammers group on Facebook about shipping corals inside cups, inside these little coral carriers. There's a lot of things like that that exist. They're really convenient. I've seen people use the uh, urine specimen cups and they're, you know, they're more, more rigid and more durable versus trusting a plastic bag. Um, I've received things that way. I've brought things home that way. I had a collection of them. I finally got rid of half of them, but I, I'm not a big fan of them. They, they can actually leak. Um, I've put that inside a bag and closed the bag to keep my stuff dry. But um, one of the techniques I've seen used for shipping frags would be to take the frag plug that the coral is on and press it into a piece of styrofoam that's the right size that then will either fit your bag or will fit in the, the little cup. And they will then put a rubber band around the styrofoam and the base of the frag plug to hold it together. And then when you get the cup, you're holding the cup and you can see the frag pointing down, but nothing's touching it, just the water. But it's, it's even less water. I think in my, um, in my example bag that I used, when I had the anemone in there and about this much water inside the bag, it weighed about seven ounces. So I had about seven ounces of water in there. I don't know how many ounces are inside those little tiny cups that uh, hold uh, milliliters. I don't know. <laughs> but the... Um, it's a little bit more water and I feel a little bit better. I'd be happier with even more water, but I have to be realistic. You can only ship so much water. Jim says, what is the best way, safest way to add a bag of new sand to the tank? Well, my trick is to take the bag and wipe it off on the outside, get a wet towel and just wipe down the bag so it's clean of whatever's on the outside of the plastic. And then I would turn off the pumps in the tank so there's no flow, move the corals out of the way that are right here in the front and I would cut the top of the bag open and I would invert the bag and put it down to the bottom and lift the bag up and let the sand just spread out. That's how I would do it. Now, when you're putting sand into an existing reef tank, you're doing it to add more sand, obviously. We don't want to smother the sand bed with a giant amount of new sand. What you're basically wanting to do is you're wanting to put in about a half an inch of new sand on top of the existing sand bed. If you go an inch above, an inch and a half above, all that bacteria will smother and die in that substrate that it was buried under the new sand so you can pour it in and just spread it into the reef and get that extra half inch on top that would be my recommendation and that's how i used to do it with my 280 i had to put in about two bags a year into that tank every single year because it was um being consumed by the reef as the ph would drop within the sand bed itself the calcium carbonate would break down and there would just be less sand in the tank and i'd put in another bag and then six months i'd put in another bag and i did that forever Let's see. Jim, this isn't a background, it's my reef tank. <laughs> oh yeah, the building up an obsession container is really nice. I've brought that home. I haven't done what you guys do, but then again, a lot of you are buying zooanthids when you're at these shows. You get all obsessed, and I'm like, I want the A-cans, and I want the SPS, and I don't know. It probably is fine for anything, but I just feel like not enough water in the container, and I feel like the uh, all the different corals are sliming into the same body of water, so I'm a little bit concerned, but what do I know? I haven't done it enough to actually give it real love or real hate. <laughs> I, I don't really have a strong opinion. I own one, but I, I only use it occasionally. I'm just getting ready to go turn the camera back on because I know it's gonna turn off again. So crazy. I have a story. I should save the story for when the camera turns off. <laughs> um. So the Herm says, I had a coral come with me on a plane. TSA opened the container and I had to put something in close to the water to see if it changed color. They closed it and let me take it on the plane. So they, it must have been one of those containers. And yeah, they want to verify what, that it's really water, not nitroglycerin or something like that. Keith says, did you already ship out all the anemones from your smaller tank? I emailed you, but didn't get a response. I replied to every single email I got, so I never got an email from you, and uh, I still have more. 
and there's about 50 in this big tank that are going to come out too. So there's no worries. I can still get one to you. Luca's already doing his water tests because it's water test Saturday. Good job, Luca. Uh, so Keith, if you're uh, wanting to get one, email me at sales at milosreef.com. I'm looking for my little list. That. Try one more time, but I didn't get it last time. Uh, M. Ruskin says, what are your thoughts on bio pellets? I ran them for a few years, worked fine. I, you just gotta make sure that the reactor is always moving. You can't have any dead time. If uh, the power goes out in your area, you need that reactor to still be tumbling on a battery backup because the bacteria will die very rapidly in there. And you don't want that to then pump back into your system when the power is restored. You need to keep those guys tumbling. That's the only downside. Um, other than that, you have to clean the bubble plate at the top because it'll clog up with sponge growth and bacteria growth and fungus and stuff and whatever that stuff is. And we want to make sure water is flowing through it. And as that gets clogged up, less water moves through it. All right. So now I can tell you guys my story. At one of the uh, trips that I was on at Amacna, they had a big mountain of uh, the salt buckets. It was like Seachem. And there was like a pyramid of salt buckets. And they were all empty. It was just to look cool on the stage or in, or in the showroom floor. And so at the end of the show, I thought, I got to bring home all these corals. How am I going to do it? And I said, can I have one of your buckets? And they're like, yeah, sure. So I took this bucket. This is a five gallon, you know, a five gallon bucket, a regular bucket of salt. And I lined it with bubble wrap and I put all my corals in there and I put newspaper in the bottom and I had the lid and I sealed it and I went straight to the airport. And I uh, came to TSA with this bucket. <laughs> now, here's a weird thing about TSA. TSA is so picky that you can't have any kind of water, can't have water bottles, can't have hand sanitizer, can't have a pocket knife, you know, you can't have anything, right? But when you're coming back from Macna, Aquashella, Reefa Palooza, uh, the one in Denver, all these different shows, right? TSA gets all excited. What did you buy? I want to see it. <laughs> and they get upset if you don't hand them bags of water. They're like, oh, you didn't buy anything? It's like, I thought you'd take it away. And they're like, no, no, we love this. This is awesome. And they're just like shoving bags of water through the conveyor for hours for every single flight. It's, it's so funny. But anyway, I get to TSA. I've got this bucket. And they're like, what's in there? I said, corals from all over the world. And they're like, uh-huh, you need to open the bucket. So I did. And they're looking in there and they're taking the bags out. They're looking at each one. They're holding up to the light. They're looking at this. Well, what's this? What's this? What's this? And they're just like, I've never seen anything like this before. I said, what, a guy with a bucket full of corals? Come on. And they were just like, I don't know. And I said, well, look, I have a reef tank at home. I can't go all over the world, but I can put corals from all over the world in my aquarium at home and enjoy them there. And I pulled out my business card and gave it to them. And they're like, well, we need to open up one of these bags and kind of do something. And I was like, all right, whatever. So they did. And then they put it all in, you know, they said, okay, you're good. And they were actually, it was like five guys. They all came over to look. They were all fascinated by these little fragments. And then... Um, when it was time to get on the plane, I had this giant bucket. You know a bucket will not fit under your seat and it definitely will not fit in the overhead. And I had this thing and I just walked onto the plane and as I'm walking in, right to the right of you is usually where first class likes to put their golf clubs and you know their, their coats and whatever. I just put my bucket there and the stewardess saw me, the flight attendant saw me, and she said, what's that? I said, I'll get it on my way out. <laughs> And I just went straight to my seat and I didn't get yelled at. I, you know, nothing happened. But I remember her reaction was like, why would you put that there? And I just was like, Cause there's nowhere else I can put a freaking bucket. It's ginormous, you know, and it all worked out fine. But that was a really funny moment. And of course, when I got home, I opened up the, uh, the bucket and everything was fine. And I, I took all the bags and put them immediately in the sump to just temperature acclimate because they had cooled off from being in a flight. Even in a closet, they cool off. So it's really important, you know, if your stuff's in the overhead or if your stuff is uh, in the luggage, it's gonna be cooler there than it is in that cabin itself. 
And so you need to get your temperatures right back on track with any bagged items. And so I always put things in the sump and let them do their thing. If the sump isn't handy, but you have a quarantine tank running, you can throw them all in there and just let them sit there for you know, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour. And then you can deal with opening and dipping and then putting them into said quarantine tank or into your, your main tank, if that's what you do. Um, Andrea, they should have contacted me. I do sell their products, but we're going to try this. I haven't even looked inside yet. Oh, it's like little tiny dots. Look, it's in focus. Oh my God, the camera works. That's so cool. <laughs> so I will have to see how I can use this. I plan to use it in the next reef reactor. Angels Reef, I definitely will give you an update. I'm going to send them a whole bunch of D's. <laughs> I'm going to make them repackage all their jars. It's so funny. Thanks, Kevin. I'm glad, to, I'm glad to hear that it looks good on there, except when the camera goes dark. It's so funny, but it literally is doing it like on a, I don't know how long, let's just say a 10 minute period. So I'm going to have to find the setting in there that stops it from doing that. And Angel, thank you so much for the super chat. I appreciate that. And Kevin also gave me a super chat. He said Spock needs some nori. Actually, I just gave her some. See, she's eating. I'm doing my best not to chew on jelly bellies while I'm on the live stream. You, just, you, just, you don't want to hear me chewing on food. Let's see. Oh, you know what? Robert says, I've used white vinegar for over 20 years and have never lost a pump to it. There was a guy who did lose a pump to white vinegar. So he had his bucket. I just happen to have one right here. And he filled it up with vinegar and water, and he put in a Rio Powerhead, or something like that brand. You know, just a big, big block pump like you'd use to move a lot of salt water. Make sure we have enough battery. <laughs> and he left it out there for months on his back step, just sitting out there in the weather, submerged. And then one day he thought, I really need to clean that pump. And when he looked in there, it looked like a rose with all the petals. It had exploded apart from the vinegar, just destroying it. But it was out, and he says, granted, it was out there for like three months in all conditions. And he's like, so I can't blame anything. It's my own fault. And that's the point. I don't know how people are destroying things. Now, I will tell you this, all you that are fearful of white vinegar, I have put very expensive pumps in muriatic acid without a second thought when everyone says, don't do it. I mean, I've had companies say, don't use muriatic acid on our pumps. Like, oh, okay. And then I just put my $800 pump in there to clean it because I can clean it in 20 minutes flat. This, I have to wait overnight. But it's just, I've done it and I didn't lose anything. The O-rings may not like the white vinegar. Matter of fact, the O-ring inside the MP60s, let's see if I can get this apart. There's an orange gasket right here. That you can just make out. Let's see if I can move a little closer. So that O-ring, when it sits in vinegar too long, gets too long. It actually expands the O-ring. And when you try and press it back into the track, there's like too much rubber. But if you let it sit for like a day or two, it will then dry out again and you can get it back into its groove. So, I mean, even then when I took too long to clean something, it ended up being okay, not great. You know, sometimes we're just busy, we don't have time or we blow it off because we're lazy sometimes, but Vinegar has not been a problem, and the muriatic acid has not been a problem. I mean, I took a Tunzi pump, a very expensive Tunzi Turbel back in the day, and the wire went all the way to a driver that was like screwed in. There was no way to like disconnect it. it was, I don't know why it was made that way, but the wire was super long, but not quite long enough to actually walk it all the way to my sink. <laughs> so I took an, a bucket of muriatic acid and water. I put the pump in there, turned it on, let it do its spattery circulation thing. And then after 20 minutes, by the wire, lifted it up, acid dripping off of it, put into a second bucket of rinse water and let it just spin around in there for a while. And then I could take apart pieces and take those pieces to the sink and clean them and clean the rest of my bucket of water near the tank. And that was the easiest way for me to clean that power head at the time. And I didn't ever have a problem with that pump. I, had, I got them used. I used them forever. And I still own one or two of them. They're just sitting in a drawer that I occasionally pull out to mix salt water. But um, yeah. So we've been using all kinds of chemicals, but I'm telling you, the fear of white vinegar that I see people posting, it, it's a little bit overrated, a little bit overblown, in my humble opinion. 
Oh, okay, thank you, Marcus. He says one of those uh, little cups, the little specimen cups, holds four ounces of water. So I was putting about double in each bag. And I, some people got four little bags or five little bags, and other people got two. So it just depended on what went in their box, who they were, what they were asking for, that kind of thing. Um, <laughs> Bots says, I just bought a pair of black storms and they're acting so weird. One of them randomly keeps resting on the sand playing dead. They're both eating well. Have you ever seen this? Uh, is this the one on the sand smaller than the other one? It could be doing a, like a little dance for the female trying to get accepted. So they will sometimes get down on the sand. They will sometimes lie down. They, they can be a little bit goofy at times. But hopefully it's not an ongoing thing and, and eventually they settle in and they pair up and they're happy together. Yes, Keith, it's sales at milasreef.com. I'll put it back on the screen for you one more time. Put it over my face. Sharon asked, uh, what about using citric acid? I've done it. I've used citric acid before and it worked just fine. The, uh, I get a little leery about damaging my sink with acid, and so I like to do those kind of things outside. <laughs> there went our camera again. At least the camera's not overheating. At least I don't think it is. Maybe that's what it's doing. It's warm. I don't know. <laughs> I'll find out after the show. I'll try to figure out what's happening. But we used it last night as a test, and I had it running for like a solid hour. And I was running on battery only. I didn't have the continuous power supply and it stayed on the whole time. Didn't turn off once. Angelo, thank you so much for the super chat. Wow. Thank you very much. And Odile, thank you very much for the super chat as well. Um, Jim says, what is the ratio of acid to water? Uh, okay, so that's another story. <laughs> it's a good thing I restarted the camera. A long time ago, I had a big barrel that I wanted to clean all the plumbing from my aquarium that I could remove. And I had these big, tall overflow boxes in my 280 gallon reef with Durso standpipes that were that tall, inch and a half pipe, covered in Aptasia. And so I pulled the pipes out, I put them in the trash can, they're all standing at an angle, you know, I had to fill the trash can so far up, like with about 30 gallons of water to cover all the plumbing. I took my lock line, you know, like, not this, but lock line, the ones that look like little black knuckles. Um, and I threw that in the barrel. I threw in power heads. I threw all kinds of stuff in there. And I just poured the muriatic acid into all the water. And that's how you're supposed to do it. You don't put the acid in and then add water because it can spatter, boil, and sting you or burn you. You always want to have the water in the container first and then gently add the acid into the water. But then what I did not do was I did not stir it. I didn't plug anything on, in, in to like move the water. I just magically assumed it would mix, which it did not. And so what happened was I'm looking in the barrel at these standpipes standing in water and that's in the, you know, the backyard in the sunlight. And I can see the Aptasia just like enjoying the sun. I was like, why are you not burning up in the acid? Why are you not dying and shriveling up? I don't understand. And I, uh, I, so I waited longer and longer and longer. You know, normally, like I said, with muriatic acid, you put something into the water and it will start to bubble immediately. And then within 20 minutes, the bubbling has stopped. That means the effect is done. So if, for example, this was covered in coralline and I put it in acid and it just like looks like, you know, foam or foam and bubbles rising, it would stop. I would then take it out and brush it to get through that layer that it has broken loose and then lower it down and see if it bubbles again. And if there's more bubbling, I leave it in there some more to get that, that strata, that layer that was underneath the top layer and then I can remove it and clean it all the way down to the plastic. So I had my big trash can. It's been sitting there for hours and I'm, I want to put these pipes back in my aquarium. <laughs> I can't because they're covered in Aptasia. So I'm reaching in, I'm pulling them out. I'm like, man, these things are tough. I can't believe it. And I'm scraping them off by hand and I'm cleaning the pipes and I'm doing pipe brushes through the holes and making sure everything's clean and ready to go so I can reinstall them. And then I reach to the very bottom of the barrel to get the lock line out and my hands are burning. <laughs> They're stinging. I'm like, man, that is weird. 
Well, what had happened, you probably guessed by now, I have this big barrel of water and I poured in the acid and the acid just went right to the bottom and sat in the very bottom. So the bottom of the trash can was pure acid. Everything above it was just regular water. That's why the Aptasia weren't dying. What ended up happening was all the lock line that was sitting in that acid cracked and every knuckle had split, split, split on the seam. And I couldn't use, the, I actually ruined the lock line because I did not stir my solution. So big mistake. Now, what could I have done differently? Um, and what I never, you know, I never made that mistake again. I like to have a power head or something plugged in that moves the circulation of the solution the entire time. So if I'm pouring an acid and I had, I don't know, a Vortec on both sides of the barrel just shooting water around and around and around, or a MaxiJet or a Rio pump or a Mag pump or anything, just to keep the water moving, that will then make sure that it's evenly dispersed and you get the right effect of acid and water. Now you asked for the ratio. I just told you a huge story of it not mixing at all. I have used 25% acid, you know, 75% water, you know, four to one. Um, I've used 50-50, I've used 100%. I mean, you know, it just depends what you're trying to do. Typically, I'm just kind of pouring it in. I don't really have a recipe. Like for example, when I want to clean my protein skimmer, I would put the protein skimmer in a large bin that came from Ikea. It's this big, huge white thing that looks like it could be a sink and it has no drain. And I put the skimmer in there I take the collection cup off. I fill the thing up with about this much water and it's a huge bin. So I don't know how many gallons it's holding. I have no idea. And then I pour in like a gallon of acid and I just plug in the skimmer and let it just run overnight. And the next day I can then take the skimmer completely apart and clean it and it's crystal clear and it's nice. The pumps are easy to clean and disassemble and put them together and get the skimmer. And I do that once a year. And I've done it with vinegar, it takes longer, but the muriatic acid works great. <laughs> And uh, I don't just have, a, I, I don't have like a real number for you. Like you got to do 33% or something like that. I don't know. But um, the one thing you have to be very careful with muriatic acid is that if it spills, it can burn white spots on the concrete. Or if it's near anything you care about, like your deck or your lawn, it could kill some of that or burn some of it. It can burn your skin. It can burn your face. You, you know, you want to wear eye protection. You want to wear gloves. You know, you want to constantly rinse things down. Uh, and then you got to dispose of it. Now, that's the hardest part because it's acid. So where can you pour out a bunch of acid? But you could add, well, go do your homework. <laughs> I am not the science channel, but I am relatively certain you can add um, baking soda to cancel out the acid and make it neutral. And then you can just pour it out anywhere along the fence line or something or down a, a drain or something. But um, I don't want you to make a volcano, so please do your homework before you to figure out how to cancel out acid, and don't rely on Mila's Reef's channel to teach you, because <laughs> I could tell you wrong and get yelled at later, and I don't want to be yelled at. Oh, thanks, Andrea. Yeah, I appreciate you checking the time on that. I wonder what it is, and you know the thing is, it literally turns off. There's nothing on the screen that's like overheating or some warning, but it's the first time using the camera with the stream, so we're just gonna have to see how it does. But it'd be really nice to find a way to make it just not do that and just do the stream because I like the way everything's looking. I love it. I really do. Um, oh, uh, Marcus is also talking about using hydrogen, like hydrogen peroxide. That's another cleaner. And you know, normally the uh, hydrogen peroxide we buy from the pharmacy is 3%. And there is a kind out there that's like 30%. And I bought it once and it had all this paperwork included with it that said, don't get this on your skin. And if your skin turns white, don't freak out. That's what happens. That's why you weren't supposed to get it on your skin. And I used that to clean my big poly tank. And uh, you know, I only had a little bit, but it actually did clean the walls of it. It's just, it's such a cumbersome thing to clean. So. I, uh, I didn't keep buying it. And I did have a second bottle in my refrigerator and one day that thing exploded in the fridge. I was sitting here watching TV, house is quiet, and I heard boom. And I'm like, what the heck was that? And then I look at the refrigerator you know, and the door was were shut. And I saw this weird liquid on the floor. And I thought the compressor underneath had exploded and leaked out something. So I called, I called Bobby immediately and I said, hey, Bobby, is this like fluid from a compressor? He's like, no. 
and it was this weird oily stuff and of course I touched it because I want to know what the heck it is fingertips were burned white <laughs> I was like oh and I opened the door and there was the ruptured per peroxide bottle and you know they said to keep it somewhere cool so I kept it in the refrigerator door and yet the thing exploded in my fridge so uh, if you are going to get the really high potency peroxide be careful with it keep an eye on it maybe open the lid to release some of the pressure so it doesn't explode my uh, tile did not become magically super duper white compared to the rest of the tile you know i thought oh watch the grout lines be like bone white <laughs> where everything else is tan that didn't happen fortunately that would have been really un you know annoying if that had happened but it was a, a really neat way to clean and uh, it is pretty safe to do let's see Jim says he's a pool guy and he has bicarb also. So is that correct? Did I say that right? Was I guessing correctly? Because I hate when I'm not positive and I have to say something live on camera. Is it adding baking soda to acid to cancel it? Can someone corroborate that? That would be nice. I'd love to wrap this up with a, a fact or two. Yes, soda ash neutralizes acid. Okay, cool. <laughs> nice. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to answer this question, even though I know it's just someone spamming the group. Have you ever peed in your reef tank? No, I haven't. As a matter of fact, when I went scuba diving, I didn't want to pee in the ocean either. There was this cute thing that they said at the dive shop. They said, who can spell scuba? And, you know, everyone raises their hand. And he says, all right, you. And I'm like, S-C-U-B-A. And he goes, that's right. There's no pee in scuba. Okay, the camera turned off. What's the time, Andrea? And so then the next question was like, who can spell wetsuit? And so, you know, someone else spelled wetsuit. He goes, that's right. There's no pee in wetsuits, so don't pee in our wetsuits. And I thought that was really funny. And, you know, we all laughed because, you know, you put on this wetsuit that makes you look like a seal and you jump into the ocean and you are swimming around and then you have the urge to pee. <laughs> and they don't want you to pee in their wetsuits. They don't... They just don't want you to do that. Makes sense. Uh, most people do it anyway. It's actually a way to get warm <laughs> without being too graphic. And, uh, you know, when you get out of the ocean, you take your wetsuit off, you're going to go clean it anyway. But still, you know, you're not supposed to do it. But a lot of people do. Well, me, I don't like to pee in my wetsuit. I definitely don't like to pee in the ocean. I'm in the ocean looking at the corals and fish, and I don't want to mess up their water. Now, granted, all those fish around me are peeing into the water and laughing at me, but I wait till I get on the boat and then I crawl into the little tiny, uh, itty bitty tiny bathroom they have and I go pee in there. And it probably just drains right back into the ocean for all I know. But that's what I've been doing for a long time. So no, I don't pee in my reef tank. I have no need to do that. But uh, thank you for asking because it gave me a chance to talk about that. Let's see. Yeah, Paula, it has to be that. I don't think it's overheating, because if it was overheating, it wouldn't turn back on when I hit the button. So it's got to be some kind of a timer that's happening. I've got it in video mode. I wonder if I could switch it to camera mode, if that would change something, you know, where it just stays on. I don't know. We'll figure it out, though. Uh, the camera we're using is a Nikon D500. Uh, Lee says, are you still liking the skies? Man, I love them. Here, you can look at them. I did turn on the Reef Bright specifically for this show to get the right mix of color for the camera. And uh, I just keep staring at my tank and everything is just so pretty. This isn't even the spectrum it normally is in. Normally it's uh, whatever the day is, but for the camera and for the live stream, I have to use this weird combination of a lot of yellow with a tiny bit of blue, and it works out really well for the stream. But no, I'm very happy with them. I, I, I'm super impressed, and you know, I was super resistant to making a change, but it's been great. I am very, I, I just want to call up Nep, uh, Terrence and say, man, these lights are awesome, <laughs> but I don't want to make his head even bigger. So don't anyone tell him I'm happy. That would be terrible. Let's see. Um... All right, well, that's pretty much it. We've answered all the questions. We have been on here now for an hour and 15 minutes, kind of short, but that's okay. I got things I need to do. 
So I want to remind you today is water test Saturday. We want to check our tanks. We want to measure everything. We want to measure alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, phosphate, nitrate, salinity, temperature, pH. Uh, we want to know what all the things are. If you have automated systems, that's fine. Um, it's fine to have automation to tell you things, but to double check with additional equipment is really smart. If you are just trusting the pH probe and trusting the temperature probe and t trusting you know, the, uh, the automatic tester, whatever it is you own, and not double checking, you may be doing your tank a disservice. So it's really good to verify. And uh, if you have old test kits, it's time to toss them and get new ones, okay? You just gotta have fresh things for your tank. Last week, one of the Club Milos Reef members had a terrible accident with his tank where his doser went crazy and dosed two liters of Nopox into his tank all at once. And the thing is, everyone's like, do a water change. Well, he could not do a water change. Number one, he didn't have any water handy, and it was a 280 gallon tank. And the other thing is that he is dealing, I think he said cancer. And so he has nothing in him to do this. And the one thing he enjoys is looking at his tank and he's watching his fish dying. I mean, it just, it was a disaster. And so everyone was offering, you know, what they could suggest. And, you know, the one thing I told him was I would, because I knew he couldn't do anything physically. He couldn't handle it. I said I would call the fish store nearest to you and tell them to bring water. And if you have a small tank, great. If you don't, um, have them bring a tank to move all your livestock into to hopefully save it. What, um, and then other people were like, where are you? I'll bring you water. Well, he was in Ireland. <laughs> and that was a little too hard for most people to do. But uh, I think it's in Ireland or Scotland. It's one of those two. But regardless, it wasn't like, you know, down the street or something where you could just drive for an hour and bring this guy some water and help. But he was lucky. He turned on every single pump he had on maximum speed. He took off the collection cup off his protein skimmer and made it do a volcano effect. He did everything he could to add air to the tank. And he ended up only losing a few small fish, but all the big fish that were lying on the sand that he was sure were dead got back up and started swimming again. So he was super lucky and it was just unfortunate. And why did it put in two liters of this stuff? Because he had just refilled the container. It was just a coincidence of bad timing. And the group was giving him advice. And so we have a really good group, Club Meals Reef. I would recommend that you join it if you haven't yet. A lot of people say that they've uh, been listening to this channel forever, and yet they're still not in the group. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll say, oh, I've been listening to Mark's YouTube for four years. And they're just now joining the group now. The group's been around, I think we're coming up on three years. We have somewhere close to 9,000 members. They are all nice people. We have a rule that you have to be nice or uh, you can't be there. And we, I, the reason it has to be nice is so that someone can go in there and ask a question, no matter how simplistic or dumb it may seem, and they can get an answer without being made fun of. I, I hate it when people say, well, I want to ask, but I don't want to be embarrassed. You know, I don't want to be attacked. I don't want to be told you should know this. All of us don't know everything. And all of us have to ask questions on a daily basis about everything we go through in life, including taking care of our aquariums, fixing our lawns, whatever it is we do. And so we made this group specifically to answer your questions. I am the one that actually approves each person. We have moderators to keep the peace. If there's anything that's flaring up and you're concerned, you don't have to fight back. You don't have to put on the gloves. You can just let us know and we'll handle it. We'll look at it. We'll see if there actually is a problem or if it's just a misinterpretation of how it's being read. But you know what? We keep the peace in there and we would recommend that uh, you do everything you can to maintain peace. If you're having a bad day, I tell you, don't go into the group. If you're having a bad day, go change water in your tank. Go do something productive. Go mow your lawn. You know, do something, use up your energy or turn on your TV and, or hide in the closet. Whatever it is you got to do. But uh, don't go in there looking to pick a fight because that would be the last time you're in there because <laughs> we don't allow that. Um, and uh, other than that, I think I've updated you guys on everything. I hope that you um, enjoy these streams, that you can um, get a lot from them. That's the whole point of why I do them. Uh, Aria just asked, how can we support Mila's Reef without going through Google? Are you on Patreon as well? I'm not, um, but I don't know. We'll figure out something. There's an actual thing I've never turned on this channel. Maybe I should just force myself to do it this week and turn on the memberships. Um, it's just a thing that allows you to have like a monthly subscription that uh, YouTube offers. And I've just kind of drug my feet on it forever. I've got a friend who bugs me all the time. Turn that thing on and I just haven't done it. So maybe I shall. Hey Jim, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. And having a shot of Crown, it sounds like a great idea right now. 
All right, guys, that's it. I'm going to stop here. Um, I do hope that you, uh, oh, well, I got to say one more thing. Turn these things off. If you haven't, I appreciate it if you shop. Let me get away from that. I appreciate if you shop for MiloshReef.com. That is how I make a living. I, uh, I know some of you are waiting on orders because I have to build them, but anything I can just put into a box that already on the shelf goes out rapidly. So uh, keep that in mind, and thank you for your patience. For those of you that are waiting, I am completely aware that you're waiting for your orders, and I am trying to be more productive week after week. And uh, so I look forward to one day saying, I'm completely caught up. <laughs> that would be amazing. But uh, for now, I, you, know, you guys have been very understanding. You've understood my, what's going on in my life. And uh, you've been super supportive and super kind and sending me all kinds of nice messages. And I read them all. And they all do touch my heart. So thank you for all of that. And uh, I hope you guys have a nice weekend. Bye.